We have a metric ton of Division II football to talk about. 12 games. I am going to try and cover every single one of them. Some will be more in-depth than others. That's for a variety of reasons. For example, let's start things off. Carson Newman at Miles. This game, a very highly anticipated matchup. And unfortunately, I wish I could have watched the first half. The broadcast difficulties for the first game of the day on ESPN+. Plus. Not a great look, and understandably so. I want to make sure that everyone knows ESPN Plus takes the feed from these smaller schools, right? So obviously, you know, the host site here being Miles, they're having some type of technical difficulty on their end. And I know everyone loves to throw shade at ESPN because I do too. I mean, get your shit together, ESPN. But um, a lot of this, unfortunately, falls on on Miles and their inability to get that broadcast up. Very frustrating from the standpoint of obviously paying for this broadcast, and I just wanted to watch what ended up being a very quality football game. We got some some clips here, a couple of them. I will not be able to show clips from the actual live stream of the game due to like monetization purposes, and I want to be able to monetize the videos. So sorry about that, but I do have highlights from just about every game that we'll be able to review and watch as we go on. But let's talk about Carson Newman coming out of the sack into the playoffs, a team that has a lot of historical success at the D2 level and now kind of trying to get back to that level under head coach Ashley Ingram and coming into a Miles team that I think is surprised a lot of people this year, myself included. I was not hip to this Miles squad, this Golden Bear squad that um, really has made a lot of noise inside of the regular season. And you look at this game, Miles opened things up first, 7 nothing in the first quarter. In the second, though, is when the majority of the scoring happened. And we went into halftime, Miles still with a, a, a one score, or sorry, excuse me, a four-point lead. And that's almost where things would end up. Carson Newman hits a field goal in the fourth quarter to make things a little bit more interesting at 14-13. to 13, Kind of a questionable decision. Only a 29-yard field goal, which is really odd. But, you know, this is the second touchdown of the day for that Golden Bear squad. We'll take a look at it right here. Coming around the edge, right into the end zone. That is Gennaro Scott in the five-yard touchdown run that would put the Golden Bears up 14-7, to had them feeling good in this one. Looks like a really neat environment down there, too. I certainly have not been on campus there, but I like the setup, some of those old-school buildings up behind the bleachers, the, the bowl kind of inset there. Really like the, uh, the atmosphere and what I've seen, at least from some of the clips. And... Um, from there, I talk about it. Miles goes on to win this one 14 to 13. Had a great clip of the celebration from the Golden Bears after this one. And their first playoff win ever for this Miles team. That is certainly reason enough to celebrate. Check it out right here. They take a knee to close things off. And the scene there was pretty awesome. And uh, kudos to them for not going like. Ballistic. I think a lot of teams, when they pick up kind of those first historic type wins, uh, they overshadow maybe and kind of um, do, really do some over-the-top celebration. They certainly earned the right to celebrate, but obviously handle your business at midfield, go through all the regular game day type stuff, and then you get to wear a smile like that if you're part of that Golden Bears team or that fandom because a very big-time historic win for this team. And they certainly are going to have it cut out for them, you know, a tough task in Valdosta State next week. But for the time being, how about just enjoy this one? Check out the press box right there. Like I said, this is a really neat-looking stadium. But to talk about this game, more particularly on the stat side of things, for Miles, I think you look at this 14-13 right there, the final that um, you see, obviously, and you could probably make this assumption, but not a whole lot of offense for this uh, Golden Bears team. And um, I think the defense stepped up for both sides. But when you had... 20 or 31 rushes, excuse me, on the day for this mile squad and finishing with 69 net yards combined with only 84 through the air. You're talking about a team at the Division II level that just won a playoff game with 153 yards of total offense. And again, that's not a shot at miles. I think if anything, it is kind of a testament to the fact that they're able to come and win a game where their offense has struggled to a major degree. Carson Newman outgained them by a factor of 2-1, to one, 305 yards to 153. Not exactly 2-1, to one, but pretty damn close, right? Carson Newman had the better time possession. They had much more yardage on the ground, 179 to 69 of miles, 15 first downs to 10 of the Golden Bears. There was a lot of metrics that were going their way. Miles punted the ball eight times in this one. But at the end of the day, what happened is this team was able to punch in touchdowns when they needed to. And Carson Newman ultimately settled for a few field goals that ended up being very critical in a matchup like this. 
right? Um, the one interception for Carson Newman, too, I don't think Miles is really able to generate I'm trying to see turnover wise. There are one fumble on each side, like nothing too ridiculous there. No outrageous or egregious penalties. I just think this is a classic case of Carson Newman being able to drive down the field and sustain these drives, but are unable to finish them with six, seven points. Right. So kudos to Miles' defense. They are kind of a bend, not break type mentality, I guess, in this one where they allow the field the team to go down the field. But when it got into that red zone area, man, things got bad quick for that Eagles offense. Let's move forward. This might be the most ridiculous matchup of the playoffs that I have ever seen. And admittedly, I've not been watching the playoffs for 10, 15, 20 years. This game was absurd. Harding, the defending national champions, the Bison, they go into the jungle at Pittsburgh State, and they handled business. They stood on business, they handled business, and they went about their business. The Bisons. 48-3 to over a Pittsburgh State team that I have talked incredibly and speak incredibly high of because they have deserved it. The Gorillas are one of the premier programs in Division II football, and for them to be embarrassed like this on their home field was not on the bingo card for anyone. For anyone, I thought this was going to be such a great game that it didn't deserve to be in the first round of the playoffs. And I still believe Pittsburgh State is one of those top-level, elite-type programs. Uh, Footage and highlights here, courtesy of KOAM, and uh, as I roll some of this and talk about this game, because I I certainly have some thoughts on it, right? We open things up here with a field goal. And Pittsburgh State, that's the opening drive. Three points against a tough Harding defense, and uh, then they go and do this. A big-time interception. This defense continuing to step up against Harding. Dela Cruz coughs up the ball in the ensuing series. He's ruled down by the officials. Pitt State challenges it. They win. Gorilla's ball. Um, and there are a lot of things going really well for Pittsburgh State at the beginning of this. And I actually want to pause uh, some of the highlights to talk about this game because it's going to get too far ahead before I can really talk about it. So Pittsburgh State feels like they have some momentum early on. The offense was not really doing its thing, but we talk about being able to generate multiple turnovers defensively. You go down and you score a field goal in your first series, right? Dela Cruz busts off like a 20, 30 yard run and coughs up the ball at the end of it. They challenge that. They get the ball back. I also love the fact that the Gorillas took a downfield shot right after that. It didn't complete it, but I love the idea of trying to go and make a big kind of swing momentum play. Now, Harding defense, they step up after the turnover. If Pittsburgh State scores... After that fumble, they make it a 10 nothing game, right? And if you're Harding, running the flex bone, triple option, these are all ifs, people. Like, give me a break here. I have to. It, that's a game. That's a recipe for Harding. They do not like to be in that situation, trying to play from behind with that offense. Against the Pittsburgh State defense, we've seen had a lot of great success up until this point. Right, So for me, that was the critical part of this game. Pittsburgh State, the Gorillas' inability to score and capitalize off that fumble, no field goal, no touchdown, no type of scoring there. That would have been potentially the recipe for disaster for the Bisons. Now Harding, they did a lot. They, they did a lot of things offensively. They tried to go to the air after successfully running the ball down the field. It was intercepted. Cole Keelan uh, tossed that one up, and unfortunately for him, Pittsburgh State comes down with it. But um, the Bisons, they were kind of having their way with this Pittsburgh State defense as the day wore on. And you had this, this looming feeling as Harding drove down the field in the second quarter that Pittsburgh State had, like I said, missed their opportunity. Here's the, the interception later on from Dodson. And... Harding scores a touchdown on that drive, right? Another Gorillas drive, interception. Harding drives down, touchdown. And all of a sudden, you're thinking to yourself here, is this game over? And you watch for a couple more minutes, and you're like, holy shit, this game is over. Like, this game has all but been decided. And Harding was absolutely gashing inside, whether it was Dela Cruz, whether it was the outside with Brayden Jay or Spice or some of these guys that are just hitting here, there, everywhere, outside on the jet, the counter, up in the middle on the dive, whether it's Cole Keelan himself taking the thing, and you got, you know, a really good mismatch. By the way, dude does throw dots. I want to make that very clear. That is a dot. They can do that down there. Uh, the boys from Cersei know how to get it done through the air as well. But uh, this Harding team looks absolutely terrifying. It looks like something that uh, you would read a bedtime story to a kid if you never wanted them to sleep at night again. This Harding team is absolutely ridiculous. And now they have a great test. You did it in the jungle. One of the toughest places to play in Division II football. Now you got to go to Lubbers, Grand Valley State. And I'm really excited to talk about that matchup because um, that is one of the more physical games you could possibly play in all of Division II football. We saw it last year came down to a fourth quarter drive by Harding. Will it be the same kind of theatrics this year? Something tells me maybe. 
And I guess I can talk about that at a different time. But uh, Harding looked incredibly dominant in that one. That cannot be overstated. Let's go to one that had much more of a photo finish than Harding and Pittsburgh State. That being Minnesota State going on the road to South Dakota, taking on Augie, Augustana on their home field. The fourth time these team, two teams have met in the last two years. That's kind of a stat in itself. These highlights, courtesy of our friend uh, Wit, Matt Witwicky over at D2Football.com. Wanted to cut these up and show these because they were great stuff that he captured from the game. You got Augie entering the field, both offenses. Looking pretty lackluster in the first quarter, although Augustana seemed to have the edge on the line of scrimmage. Offensively started to get the ground game going. Now right here, there was a big interception from Ankato, and then a huge sack. They rebound with this play, Treshawn Watson. Grabs the ball off the Augie defender. That, for me, was the play of the day for this Mankato offense. At the interception, you get sacked, and you rebound with a play like that. Now, Epperson, he left the game in the second quarter. Part of the reason why the Vikings settled for a field goal earlier. He's back here for the touchdown. 16-10 Vikings doing a little dance in the end zone. The dude is absolutely feeling it. Now, here... The onside kick for the Mavs with a minute 30 left. They recovered the onside kick. At this point, 1917, a minute 30 left in the game. That felt like magic happening. Now, though, game winning field goal as time expires, 34 yards out for the win. Snap, hold, kick, all good. Comes together. Mankato plays spoiler. Against Augustana, they stormed the field and have a hell of a time over there. This game, I mean, talk about absolutely electric, pretty on-brand NSIC football if you watch this one. Um, just a really fun and exciting game to watch. Not if you were an offensive mind in the first half, I will say. Um, there were some moments there where you're kind of waiting for these teams to figure it out. But... Uh, Man, really big-time performances. Three interceptions total on the day. Eckern had one for Minnesota State, and then Gunnar Hensley for Augie had two through the air, and and you saw that uh, MSU Mankato, they capitalized on one of those. Now, the rushing attack for Minnesota State was was not really anything that was, you know, anything to write home about, but Jared Epperson also struggled on the day. I talked about he left in the second quarter. Um, I believe it was some kind of foot injury that he was able to shake off, but 21 carries for 66 yards and that one touchdown, that, that's a pretty meager stat line for him. Uh, wouldn't you say, Buzz? Uh, that's a pretty meager stat line for him uh, at this level of play, especially. But Mankato, that is a, a really statement type of win. They had some guys on defense that certainly stepped up. Uh, Joey Gottle, hopefully pronouncing that one correctly, had one pick on the day. And then Richard Richard A., we'll say, had the other interception. You had four different guys with TFLs. How about Nathan Drum, Maven Kretschke, a name that we've talked about a lot in that Minnesota State side both in the backfield registering some sacks for the Mavericks. And a big-time game, a big-time win for that Minnesota State side. Excuse me. Let's move forward. Let's talk Ashland football pulling off what might be the upset of the weekend. The Eagles go into Charleston, a team that just dominated the MEC and coming into the playoffs, had the two-seed behind a dominant Kutztown squad, and... Uh, this one was was a very entertaining game to watch in its entirety. Now, um, these highlights just from Ashland up on Twitter. Go take a peek. But the defense for the Eagles stepped up early. They had a fumble recovery on a strip sack that was really nice. You see Siobhan Wright getting taken down here. And honestly, in the first part of this game, they really minimized his impact. I was very impressed with this Ashland defense. And um, they... Had a deep ball touchdown. The broadcast put the points on the wrong side of the scoreboard. I was so confused watching the game. It said Charleston was up 7-0, but I just watched Ashland score the ball, and they kept it up there for a while. Um, the Golden Eagles, they went into wildcat formation on the goal line. They finally punched it in on fourth down. Siobhan Wright had some more physical runs in that second quarter. Felt like he started to establish himself against that defense, and he did end up having a decent day, all things considered. Um, broke a couple long runs, turned the momentum for this Charleston squad. This game was very back and forth. The Ashland pass game got hot as the game went on. And this one, 40-38, to 38, Ashland wins it with a game-winning field goal as time expired. Trevor Byzinski, 28-42, 435 and three touchdowns for the man under center for the Eagles. Siobhan Wright, 42 carries in the day. Talk about an absolute bell cow for this Charleston team. And um, not the end of the season that he or his teammates wanted, but 42 carries for 226 and a touchdown. He certainly still made his impact. And when I tell you, the longest run of the day for him was 18 yards. He was chunk playing these guys. Is in the fact of like 
not 30, 40 yard gashing type plays. He's going to go get six. He's going to go get eight. He's going to get four. He's going to get five. He was just beating these guys all the way down the field. And um, at the end of the day, it wasn't enough. And kudos to Ashland. If you have a guy like him with his talent level to have 42 carries and he doesn't break one off longer than 18 yards, telltale sign of a very good defense is playing some very sound gap assignment type football. Uh, Tony Panunzio for Ashland, 14 catches, 228, and one touchdown receiving. Very impressive. Very impressive. Now, Ashland plays spoiler. Can they keep it going? We shall see. But that was, for me, that was the upset of the day. I mean, that's a great program kind of defining win for this Ashland squad that you talk about at the beginning of the year for this Ashland team. This team has experienced more ups and downs than most throughout the course of their season. They started the year 0-2. They played, granted, some really quality opponents against uh, IUP and Ferris State to start the year. They went on to win their first five in conference play, six, seven games in conference play. They lose a tough one against Walsh to kind of close out their conference play in the Great Midwest Athletic Conference, still end up winning the conference, close out with a nice win over Kentucky Wesleyan, but it felt like maybe not riding the right momentum into the playoffs. After that tough loss against Walsh, they rebounded in a big way, and now they'll have a great challenge in Cal PA this coming weekend. Now, to close the door on that, really cool statistic on this Ashland team that I certainly wanted to highlight here. Right here, the Ashland football team trailed 21-10 in the third quarter today at Charleston, but won 40-38. It is the first time the Eagles have won an NCAA D2 playoff game when trailing by double digits at any point. Shout out to you, Dusty. Thank you for the stat, brother. That is an awesome stat and a very telling stat of the fight and the grit of this Ashland squad, and I'm excited to watch them continue along the way. Let's keep it moving. Back in Super Region number three, Grand Valley State playing host to U Indy, the Greyhounds. Coming into Lubber Stadium, the Black Unis, the Blue Pants for this Grand Valley State squad. I'm going to pull it up here in just a second. Absolute, probably the cleanest look for this GVSU team, I will say. Highlights here courtesy of Fox 17 down there on the west side of Lower Michigan. Let's take a look at the proceedings in this one. Grand Valley, that Laker defense, absolutely, absolutely suffocating. This, though, the big-time play, touchdown pass to Kellen Reed in the back of the end zone. The Greyhound defense, I want to give them kudos. They played outstanding. And these two plays right here to Johnson and um, to Reed for these two big, long touchdown plays, that does not tell the story of this game. Grand Valley eventually did wake up. Their offense comes alive. 24-7 final. The Lakers take this one. But this really, this Greyhound attack, they were swarming to the ball early, stuffing the run. I have not seen a team have this much success stifling the Laker rushing attack in a long time. And I want to make sure I give credit where credit is due there because this UND team uh, absolutely deserved it. And um, when you look at the statistics here in the box score, I think that tells more of an overall story here. And that being that Grand Valley was held to... 68 yards rushing on the day. I don't know when the last time that happened was. I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. You know, it feels like it's been a while, and um, they passed the ball pretty efficiently, and they're passing their defensive secondary for Grand Valley stepped up to the plate under 100 yards for this suck-up and this offense. Uh, Sukup, I'm hopefully pronouncing that one correctly, the quarterback for UIndy. But uh, early on in this game, I think one of the, the kind of the big swing points, this game, it was 7 nothing going into halftime. It certainly felt like it could have been 21 nothing. Grand Valley. They were determining the pace of play. Their offense wasn't really sustaining drives, but their defense was absolutely suffocating. And um, the Indianapolis quarterback, he had a shovel pass right into the hands of Jimmy Downs for Grand Valley. He drops it. It would have been interception on like the five-yard line. That felt like a potential swing moment. Now, Grand Valley it didn't come back to bite him in the ass or anything, but that could have been a really big swing play. The Lakers receiver, uh, or they recovered a fumble in the second quarter. That game uh, could have already been 21 to nothing, like I said, but GVSU playing kind of has we, we've come to expect. This Lakers squad we've seen throughout the course of the year, they're not going for style points. They certainly have not run the score up on teams. Even a team like Roosevelt, maybe that struggled throughout the course of the year. Um, they didn't really put away teams like Michigan Tech or Davenport, these kind of squads, and uh, they're still just going out and finding ways to win. And I think that's kind of the mantra from Wooster and company over there is that, like, you don't get bonus points for winning by 20 or 30. All that matters is you have more on the scoreboard than the other team at the end of the day. Now, the Grey Greyhounds offense, they did find a little bit of life at the end of the first half. First time they had kind of any momentum, it felt like they got stopped. Uh, but an interception 
for UND's defense gave them a great finish to the half, kind of stifled that Grand Valley attack. In the second half, it felt like the air left the building in Allendale. Uh, Sukup runs in the touchdown, and GVSU not really putting up points. It felt like it could have bit them in the ass going forward as a tie ball game. This thing could have gone either way. Lakers woke up. Lakers got some stuff done. That defensive front from Grand Valley, the defensive secondary, both stepped up. I mean, in big ways. Look at defensively. Who had some of those performances for GVSU? Go down the list. Anthony Cardamone, Jimmy Downs, Jack Grice, uh, Ian Canelli made some big plays in the secondary. Our guy Jack Gilchrist, Niles King. Everyone was out there making plays, forcing fumbles in the backfield. TFL, sack, total just tackles all over the board. Um, it, it was a really impressive overall performance from that Grand Valley State defense. But again, that... Uh, that indie defense, Clay Schultz kind of led them, led the charge there. 13 tackles, three TFLs, and an interception on the day. Schulte, hopefully I'm pronouncing that one correctly. There's a lot of really good things and takeaways. If you're an U indie team that felt like, yeah, you know what, they kind of got disrespected going into the playoffs this year. And I think they earned my respect watching that game. Unfortunately for them, it was not enough to overcome a really talented Grand Valley State squad. Let's move over, though. Let's talk about Wachita Baptist going into central Oklahoma. The Bronchos picking up their first playoff win in 25 years, 38-31. Jet Huff back under center for this UCO team. He's been back and forth in that room. We talked about uh, Terrell Davis about that earlier on. And for that reason, I won't talk too much about this game. Highlights here courtesy of Oklahoma News 4 as we go through and break down a little bit of this contest down there in Edmond. And uh, long touchdown from UCO right up the gut. I'm sure we'll see it here semi soon. You see the defense here for the Broncos stepping up early on. And, excuse me, it felt like there was some pretty poor tackling from that Wachita Baptist side. Here comes the uh, touchdown right here up the middle. You see a pretty weak effort from the defensive secondary coming right there. Breaks a couple arm tackles and goes the distance. Kudos, though, right there on the cutback. Wide open. Take that in for the score. And uh, OBU, some trickery. They had a big man touchdown to close out the first quarter. How about these guys? <laughs> that is awesome. But OBU was getting some things done. They had a big man touchdown, uh, kind of a trick play to close out the first quarter, and some good things going for Wachita. Oklahoma, Central Oklahoma, rather, they led this game all the way until about three minutes left in the fourth quarter where OBU actually took their first lead of the game. That was one of the better catches of the day. Holy. Um, but when it mattered, uh, UCO drove down the field, and, and Jet Huff really looked in command of this offense. And uh, there's one of the many plays and passes that he completed throughout the course of this one. And it felt like they had a really good grasp on what their offense was capable of. And when they were able to manage some of those time restraint type situations, the team stepped up and, and did just that in some of the bigger moments of the day. And the ground game for UCO, man, I mean, they had themselves a day when it came to to running the football, and I think that's something that we haven't seen too much from them. Jalen Cottrell, 17 carries, 151 yards, and two touchdowns for uh, Agent Zero right there up on your screen. Jet Huff finishes 36 of 58 with 371 yards, three touchdowns, did have one interception on the day. And this one, like I said, came down to it. They lose the lead with about three minutes left in the fourth. They regain it with a minute 12 left, but then Dax Jaggers for OBU, a 40-yard field goal with five seconds left in the game, evens it up at 31 apiece, so we're going to overtime. Can't be decided in regulation. Now, in OT, UCO gets the ball, scores like they've been doing all day. Now on to the defense to see if they can make the play. Shout out to Jonathan Godot for the, the video and the clip here. The defense, they did just that down at Edmond. You see here, OBU... Squaring up, trying to make it into the end zone. They need a touchdown to keep the game going. A lot of time, pocket starts to collapse. He goes down, ball comes out, Broncos on top of it, and that is the recipe for success. Actually get coughed up, a Baptist got back on it, but it did not matter. It was over at that point, and that is the first playoff win in 25 years for this Broncos squad. This is a team that has absolutely earned it throughout the entire course of the season. You see the delayed reaction from them, and now they know the game is over. Come out of the field, and that squad has certainly earned it. The last MIAA team standing inside of the Sweet 16 in the Division II playoff. Really an awesome scene 
excited for those guys down there in Edmond. And this was a, a very telling game for UCO. And now, the thing is, are you going to be able to match that level and continue to go against the Ferris State squad that we know is incredibly talented on both sides of the ball? The physicality of Ferris and that defensive front and that front seven is going to be something that I think UCO is going to struggle with greatly. Now, I think the biggest piece, when you watch Jet Huff in that offense, assuming he's back under center for them this weekend, what does their quick game look like? If you're UCO, we saw a lot of here where they'd come across and maybe a little bit longer developing routes, whether it was a deep kind of dig or post corner, some of those type of deals in the outside, these kind of longer developing routes where you need to get guys into the second level of that defensive secondary. What does their quick game look like? What do we have built into the playbook here that we can throw off of a, you know, we need like a hot route or we need someone where we've got someone coming off the edge unaccounted for in our blitz pickup. And I think Ferris is going to dial up that pressure and really not allow them to complete balls 5, 10, 15 yards down the field. So for me, for UCO, how are they going to keep that passing attack alive, get the ball to their playmakers in space in a quick, maybe three-step drop type of quick passing type situation? I think they showed a decent blueprint of that in that two-minute drill they had at the end of the game. Again, Huff looked like he had a great control of that huddle and kind of the pace of play, but I'll be very interested to follow that one as we keep going. But let's move forward. I got to stop and take a breath sometimes. I get too excited talking about these games. Slippery Rock playing host to New Haven. This is a rematch of a regular season matchup we saw earlier in the year. Slippery Rock continues their streak over the Chargers. 14-7. The Rock takes this one. And, uh, you know, for this, a blocked field goal <clears throat> at the start of the second quarter. I had this written down. That felt like a big momentum play for Slippery Rock. I believe they're only up 7 nothing at the time. And for them, that could have been a way for New Haven to kind of open the door, so to speak, and help build their confidence as the game continued to go along. Slippery Rock snuffs out any kind of hope that this Chargers offense and kind of attack had. You block a field goal, you play some very complimentary ball, and when you look at this defensive effort from Slippery Rock, uh, 260 yards total offense for this Chargers team is, is not what we've come to expect from them, especially only 63 yards on the ground. Now, granted, Slippery Rock struggled on the ground very much as well. There's that blocked field goal. Only 37 yards from the Rock when it came to toting the ball on the ground. And uh, that's kind of surprising. You talk about a guy like uh, Idris Lawrence, the Notre Dame college transfer. He had 13 carries, only finished with 42 yards. That's like an all-region, all-American type talent for Slippery Rock that has been kind of overshadowed this year. Braden Long very much still doing his thing. 21-34, 270 and a touchdown for the Slippery Rock kid over there. Defensively, big-time performances for the Rock. Andrew Vince, 14 tackles on the day. That's big time. Had a couple other guys register some TFLs. Uh, Munchie Johnson, I think, was all over the field. Hell of a name, by the way. Munchie Johnson was all over the field. Um, and this was, uh, again, another statement win for a Slippery Rock squad that, like GVSU, not winning with style points, but really grinding out a gritty type of game and being able to get a result at home. Let's move forward and talk about a very exciting game, that being Virginia Union at Wingate. These highlights I'm about to show here, courtesy of WBTV3. Wingate stunned in the first round. Virginia Union overtime win, 34-31. The Panthers take this one. I'll get the film up here after... Uh, I'm not going to make y'all sit through and watch the ad. But um, the Panthers, this is a huge win for them. And I think they have been doubted. Whether that was because of their recent struggles in the playoffs, the third year the Panthers have made the playoffs, they've been unable to get out of the first round. I think part of that history was certainly part of the reason why they have been doubted coming into this matchup. This Wingate team we've seen play at an incredible clip against some great competition in the SAC throughout the course of the season. I think that was another part of the doubt against Virginia Union is, you know, coming out of the CIAA after that championship performance, it was like, yes, you beat Virginia State and you had some other good performances throughout the year, how are you going to match up against a team that we know is battle-tested? At their place, they answered the bell, man. They really did. They stepped up to the plate and made some really, really great plays. Um, in this one, it was kind of unfortunate. I will say that uh, I really wish I could have watched more of this. The signal was so intermittent, it wasn't even worth putting on because you'd get like 30 seconds of gameplay, and then it would cut out. So I admittedly, I didn't keep this game on for the entirety of it. But uh, a big day for, for HBCUs around. We talked about Miles earlier on. Virginia Union picking up their first win, I believe, playoff win in their team's history. And a breakdown of this one. 
Virginia Union at halftime led by a very narrow margin. 21-20, this is absolutely anyone's game. And uh, Wingate kind of came out on top in that second half. They go to up 28-21. And um, this kind of, it could have slipped away from Virginia Union at any point. And kudos to them. They bounce back. 20 seconds left in this one. And uh, Jeremy Francis, nine-yard touchdown pass from RJ under center there. They even things up at 28 apiece. That means we have overtime. Wingate has the ball first. 39-yard field goal off the foot of Caleb Bonesteel. Hell of a name. Uh, 31-28. Now, Virginia Union, they have the opportunity to tie it up with a field goal or to go for the entire win. You saw it there in the, in the clips towards the end of it. The tush push kind of on the, uh, on the goal line there. That was RJ under center for them. The one-yard touchdown run. Seals the deal for Virginia Union and just an absolute gritty, gutting out kind of win for this Virginia Union squad. And I will pull up the uh, the little graphic here because I thought this was a cool graphic. Um, and it also shows you right there on the bottom, first playoff win in school history. Kudos to the Panthers. That is an absolutely incredible feat against a really solid opponent in Wingate. And it was, like I said, it was a big day for HBCUs. And here you have a cool graphic that we had put out on social in collaboration with some other people. The first time two HBUs have won a Division II playoff game in the same season. In the 51-year history of the D2 playoffs. That's awesome. That is incredible. And I'm just glad that we're here to witness history, history excuse me, and that these two teams are able to perform at this level. So kudos to both those squads. Talk about Virginia Union and uh, Miles earlier on in the show couple more games here at the D2 level to recap. This one I won't spend uh, too much time on, although it did have an incredible finish. East Stroudsburg going on the road to take on California PA in a PSAC matchup. And this one, East Stroudsburg comes out swinging here. 14-10 uh, early in the second quarter. They certainly had some things going. Uh, Tier Mills would score in the second corner. Bobby Boyd had some things going as well on the ground for this Cal PA squad. But going into halftime, East Stroudsburg was up. It was Bo Hazer, hopefully pronouncing that one correctly, on the touchdown pass from Sean McTaggart, 21-13, going into halftime. And Cal would respond coming out of the half. This one got very interesting towards the end of the game. A touchdown pass from Tag McTaggart to John Siggins for ESU gave them the lead 27-19 in the third quarter. It took until the fourth quarter for Cal to respond with a Davis Black quarterback one-yard run there. A 77-yard drive, 13 plays. We had things tied up at 27-27. Now, back and forth, back and forth, vying for what would ultimately, assumedly be the game-winning type of play came down to literally the last second. Cal PA has the ball, needs to make something happen. Anthony Bytko, 29 yards as time expires for the Vulcans. There it is. He knocks it through the uprights. The Vulcans advance to the next round. They take this one 30 to 27 off the foot of their savior in this one. He had another, um, I believe, one other kick in this one as well. And uh, two other field goals, excuse me. So was a big part of this uh, this Vulcan team. Has been throughout the course of the season, but certainly today felt like a very, very important piece of that. So shout out to him. Shout out to that uh, Cal PA squad that is continuing their playoff hunt. A couple more D2 games here. Let's talk about Central Washington at Western Colorado. This one, a late comeback from the Wildcats, not quite enough to give them the edge over the Mountaineers out of Western Colorado. The Armac team comes out on top here on their own field. 28-21, the Mountaineers take this one. And when you look at this, this Western Colorado squad did get up relatively early. You look at um, in the second quarter, it was kind of anyone's game. And then in the third quarter, 21-10, Western Colorado takes the lead. And a couple scores from this uh, Central Washington squad made things interesting. But it simply just uh, was not enough, too much to overcome here. A Mountaineer team that we've seen has just been really, really proficient uh, defensively and offensively. They play a lot of complimentary ball over there. Drew Nash, star of the show for this Mountaineer team. He was 12-21, 164 yards and three touchdowns through the air. He also carried it 19 times for 127 yards and a touchdown on the ground. 
he literally was the majority of their offense on the day. He did a very good job at that. Now, uh, Kennedy McGill for CWU, 17 carries, 113 yards, and a touchdown of his own. Tyler Flanagan had uh, some plays in the ground as well, but uh, McGill under center for that Central Washington squad certainly had some things going. I think the one thing that uh, we've come to associate with this Central Washington team, we didn't really see as many takeovers or takeaways, excuse me, generated from this squad. And actually what we saw is that Central Washington fumbled twice and lost both those fumbles in this one. So the turnover battle certainly went the way of the Mountaineers and they were able to capitalize on it. That was a big part of this game. Central Washington did win the time time of possession battle pretty decisively by 10 minutes, 35 to 25 minutes which is really surprising when you think about it. And there were 4-4 four four in the red zone. But when you talk about some penalties at certain points in the game and you talk about uh, a couple of those fumbles, those are going to be drive stoppers. And it's really hard to bounce back from that, especially when most of these drives Central Washington was sustaining were on the ground. They had 15 first downs rushing the ball. And something as simple as a, a big-time penalty can certainly slow down that kind of attack if you're Central Washington. Okay, moving forward, still in Super Region number four, Bemidji State at Angelo State, the Beavers, who have quite the track record now in recent history coming to the NCAA playoff in their fourth straight national tournament. And for the second year in a row, they go down to Texas and pick up a big-time win against a Lone Star Conference opponent. The Beavers win this one 24-14. Last year it was UTPB. This year it's the Rams from Angelo State. Bemidji State, a really impressive performance from this squad, not too many video highlights here. Just a little bit of the uh, post-game celebration from the boys after this one. Bemidji State scores 10 in the fourth quarter, and that would kind of be the separator for this squad. Sam McGath uh, was the man under center for this Bemidji squad, and they really didn't do much through the air. It was Connor Carver who had things going, rushing the ball for BSU. Eight carries, 114 yards and a tud, one of those going for about 60 that feels pretty nice, excuse me, for Bemidji State. Um, like I said, not much going on through the air. 7-14 for 30 yards, a touchdown, and an interception. That was not the name of the game for this Bemidji State attack. When you look at it defensively, though, you start to understand that that's where Bemidji State really separated themselves. Running the ball, Bemidji State finished with 231 yards while Angelo was held to only 93. 230 yards of total offense for this Rams team is not something we have come to expect. You also look here, two interceptions for this Bemidji State squad. Um, that was a really tough thing uh, for Angelo State to overcome, the two interceptions through the air, and that's where uh, you kind of get away with a little bit less total offense when you're able to generate those turnovers if you're BSU. And I think um, other things that stand out, Bemidji State, 2 of 15 on third down. Like, really not the best offensive day for Bemidji. But defense travels in an environment like this where you have to travel across the country. You know your defense is going to show up. We've talked about Marcus Hansen and that front defensive unit for Bemidji State. They are certainly going to be a threat as we continue on into the playoffs. Now, Lenore Ryan at West Alabama, another game that really came down to it. West Alabama, they fall short. Lenore Ryan the one SAC team still standing in the D2 football playoffs with Carson Newman and Wingate both dropping their playoff contests. Now, this game was a shootout, uh, much more so than some of the other ones. It was a kind of quiet first quarter, 7-7 seven to seven at the end of the first. There was a combined 37 points scored in the second quarter alone of this one, which feels pretty noteworthy. So we'll take a look here at some of the highlights from this one, courtesy of ABC 11, excuse me. And when you look at this one right here, the biggest notes from this Lenore Ryan squad, that's Jalen Ferguson, the man under center for the Bears. 22 of 40, 411 yards, and three touchdowns for Lenore Ryan. He was doing it all for them on the day. And uh, that, that really was the name of the game. They didn't do too much rushing the ball, only had 49 yards on 27 attempts. But uh, a lot of really good things going on for this LRU attack. 
Uh, Adonis McDaniel, seven catches for 200 yards and two touchdowns. You had Sonya Yates with five catches and 107 of his own. And uh, some really good things going on, like I said, for this Lenore Ryan team that we've seen battle back and forth. Some uncharacteristic losses for this squad. But again, you bring in a new coach like Doug Sosha from the NAIA level at Kaiser, and he's still got this program doing exactly what we've come to expect them to do in November, which is win meaningful football games. And for Lenore Ryan, they are very good at that. Uh, Damian Savage had the pick on the day for Lenore Ryan through the air. That was a big takeaway. Jalen Willis led the squad defensively with 10 tackles and a TFL. And then you had JT Black, who forced and recovered a fumble for this Bears squad. But here's a look at the full bracket. When it comes to D2 football this coming week, Man, do we have some great matchups. Up in Super Region 1, Kutztown, Slippery Rock, back for the PSAC showdown. You got Ashland and Cal PA, three PSAC squads still standing up there in Super Region 1, which is wild. Over in Super Region 2, Valdosta State and Miles Square off, along with Lenore Ryan and Virginia Union, both still alive. In number three, some of the highly anticipated matchups, Ferris State and Central Oklahoma, followed by Harding and GVSU up there in Lubber Stadium. You got CSU Pueblo and Minnesota State. In Super Region number four, and finally Western Colorado in Bemidji. Comment below. Let me know who you think you got winning at all. I'm excited to see how these playoffs play out.